when we separate ourselves and embrace our individuality, then we really set ourselves up to, to recognize that we don't have to be friends with everyone. We have to be friendly. And we set ourselves up to be more kind to one another because we are comfortable in, in, in our own skin. My name is Sarah Howard. I'm the Youth and Community Services Manager here at the Daniel Boone Regional Library, and happy Thursday and welcome to our Zoom room. Tonight, we're going to have a program about the power of kindness, and I'd like to turn it over to Kim Dude, who's the president of Children's Grove, and they are the sponsor of the program this evening. Thanks for coming. Yes, welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled that you're interested in this topic because this is really what um, Children's Grove is all about is trying to turn up the volume on kindness and make kindness the norm. So I thank you for coming. I especially want to thank Dr. Chad Rose from the university. He's an associate professor in the Department of Special Education. He's the director of graduate studies in the Department of Special Education. And he's the director of the Mizzou Ed, um, Ed Bully Prevention Lab. So in his spare time, he has been willing to do this for us. So I thank you very much, Chad because we've used him before in our anti-bullying presentation about a year ago. So we know he's great and I appreciate him helping us out again. Take it away. Great, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, so first off, I'm gonna start by showing a, a video from um, some of our, our local high school students on uh, kindness that they have either experienced, witnessed or engaged in and um, at that point, then I will uh, I will introduce myself a little further and talk a little bit about my work and kindness. So let's see if we can do this. A kind act that was done for me, um, and this is an act that is kind of done a lot by one of my best friends. She always calls me. Um, I never have to ask her to call me. It's just kind of something that I'm always in her thoughts. And so she calls me in the evening and especially now during the spring when it's um, kind of stressful with like the ACT and just finals and EP exams coming up. She always finds time to call me and ask me how I'm doing and talk to me about what's going on in my life. And we just talk about each other's lives and find out how we're feeling at that time. And that has really, help me cope um, with a lot of the stressors that come with school, um, my social life, external factors, my family, and it's just really nice of her to do that for me. I guess an act that I try to do for other people is I try to be pretty conscious of what I'm saying. So um, I don't say things even if they're hurtful and I'm thinking them. And um, I think that just kind of I mean, just thinking before we say things, I think is a really important thing to do, especially now in this climate um, with everything that has to do with politics and just what's going on at school. Um, there are a lot of hot topic, contentious issues happening. And I think just being really mindful of what we're saying is really important. When I was younger, I would go to visit my father down in Grove, Oklahoma. He is physically handicapped. He was, um, um, paralyzed waist down so he was in a wheelchair and he couldn't do much for himself so he couldn't go to the store and so when it came to things like that it was really difficult and he was on his own he was in a retirement home area situation so there's like all these old people the area was great of course and he loved it because it was off the lake but there was like this lovely couple who were there and they really were so nice and they would drive him or go get groceries for him if he needed something. And they were always willing and always there. And I really, that was impactful to me. And I was young and I didn't know, but as I grew up, they were always there. They were like a extra set of grandparents when I was down there. And because there was no kids my age, I was alone, but they took me in. Um, the woman, she was like super close and she would take me out, whether it was to go get food or thrift shopping. She gave me some old toys they had, and I know that impacted me really highly because it made me see that there are people out there that were willing to do good, even if they just don't know you. And that's happened like many times over my life. Um, 
there was a time where it was really late at night. My mom had gotten off her um, late shift and we went to Country Kitchen when it was open here. And we were just talking and talking about the situation we were in and this old couple overheard us and they paid our bill. And that has like lived with me forever because things like that is so nice to know that there are people out there that are willing to do that. And I know if I was given the chance, I would try to go and pay them back. I would say it would start my freshman year, you know, after COVID, everything like that. I was just like going by high school, right? And one of my friends like asked me, hey, do you want to meet my teacher? He is different. I'm like, all right. So I talked to the teacher. He got me into this many opportunities and stuff like this. And I was like, what the heck? How did he open me up this quickly? It was like, he, it was really comfortable talking to him and stuff like that. And eventually I ended up in his class next year. And that's when things got so amazing from there. It was like, hey, Leslie, you should do this. I'm like, okay, hey, Leslie, go after school for this club. All right. And then it just from there after that summer, it just made me a better person. Over the summer, I grew a lot and now I'm here, which is like, oh, wow. I've never opened up in my show more than now. Thinking from freshman year what am I gonna do I'm in high school and stuff like that COVID and stuff but now after meeting that one person I wasn't even his student and he talked to me took the time to do all that stuff so much effort it really changed my life with elementary school so around the very beginning um, our principal Mrs. Harmon would make sure that all the students had the essentials, and given that this was not as well funded as this district, district is, that often took place in the form of pantries, donations, etc. When we first came to Columbia, uh, Ms. Jacobs from Jacobs Property Management was able to put us in one of their storage units, rent free and utility free, until October 2021. Overall, um Pretty recently, I had a family member pass away. They were 17 years of age, and we had kind of grew up with each other, despite living maybe like an hour or so away. Uh, he lived down at Salisbury, uh, and on Tuesday of last week, we went to his funeral. Before then, I learned about it, uh, his passing a week prior, and during that week, I kind of felt my mental health slipping down a hole in a way, just because it had left a pretty big impact on me. And overall, I would have probably stayed in the hole a lot longer had it not been for my friends. My friends, uh, especially the ones that are with me in battalion, they came up to me, they noticed that something was a little different and they actively supported me. They listened to my story, they gave me hugs and we hung out. And having that support with my people, with my friends, helped me bring myself back, help me re-bring the person that they knew, the person that I knew I was, back into the light, per se. Yes, I still feel pretty upset about their passing, if I'm honest. However, I'm not letting that drag me down and keep me down in the ground. Instead, I'm gonna keep moving my feet along and kind of walk forward, I should say. Had it not been for my friends though, I feel my mental health probably would have stayed down there for a bit. And so I'm really glad that they were able to help me out and bring me back to the light, per se. I would like to thank uh, Maya Morris who filmed and produced that. Um, and I appreciate all of the statements from our youth in the community. And now we'll go ahead and look at kind of kindness and what it is. Um, and so I'm gonna have a little bit of a transition here as I get everything up and running, but I'm happy to be here with you all. Uh, I am Chad Rose. I am an associate professor in the Department of Special Education at the University of Missouri. I'm also the director of the Mizzou Education Bully Prevention Lab. 
Uh, and I have spent the better part of my career studying bullying and bully prevention. And uh, I started my career out as a high school special education teacher where I was working primarily with youth with uh, behavior disorders, um, youth that had behavior plans, and some of them had engaged in violent and or aggressive behaviors in the past. And uh, kindness goes a long way when working with all youth, including youth uh, with uh, significant needs. Um, but I've been studying bullying for uh, a long time now. And in my path of studying bullying, I also started focusing on the flip side of that. What is kindness and how kids are cultivating relationships and how kids are cultivating friendships? And I think for me, that's that's an important piece. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to go down this roadmap and um, we'll try to get through all of this in a timely manner. Uh, but uh, the first thing is we're going to define kindness. What is kindness and what does it mean? And then we're going to look at teaching kindness. Um, we're going to move into how kids are cultivating friendships uh, because friendships and being kind within your friendships is a little bit different. Uh, then we'll talk about speaking with youth. And then uh, I will close with some messages for youth. So we've all heard these things, pay it forward or give back and repay in kind and all these things. Um, one, one statement that resonates a lot with me is uh, I was listening to Michelle Obama recently, and uh, you know she has the famous statement, when they go low, you go high. Um, and that piece resonates with me a lot because this thing about going high, this thing about always having class and always uh, focusing on the positive and always being kind or always uh, addressing things with kindness, uh, is really some words to live by, something that, that we all can do a better job with, I'm sure. Um, but I always want to think about that when I'm working with youth, my own daughter, uh, the kids that I work with in some of our studies, and, and even some of my pre-service teachers when preparing them to be educators. But what is kindness? I mean, this idea of kindness is, is a challenge uh, because we don't know if it's if it's behaviors or emotions or or thoughts or a personality trait. Uh, I've been looking at the literature for a long time and looking at how people are defining kindness, and and really most people have settled on this idea that it's positive behaviors, dispositions, and emotions intended to benefit uh, or support others, and so. With that definition of mind, we think about the when these things are, are synthesized. So the first thing that uh, someone does that engages in high levels of kindness is they have this ethical, um, this ethical interpersonal virtue. So intrinsically, they believe in kindness uh, and they believe that it's the ethical way to go through their day to day. And that begins with cognition. That begins with with their with their thoughts. Um, it begins with uh, perspective taking, uh, being open minded, uh, respecting one another, and being able to understand others' perspectives, even when they are different than their own. Then we get into these these emotions, these kind emotions, and these emotions center around morality and sympathy and empathy. Uh, compassion, being tender, uh, and having gratitude uh, for the interactions with others. And then the last piece is behaviors, what they do with these cognitions and emotions. Uh, this is this is really the actions that that most people identify with kindness, right? I mean, random acts of kindness it, are those behaviors that we're talking about. Now, um, I'm a social ecologist, so when I think about behaviors and behavioral development, including kindness and, and how, it, how it centralizes in, in one's life, um, I think about genetics, right? First, I think about the, the genetics, the, those things that we are born with, those, those intrinsic values that, that we are born with. And then I look at uh, the family and look at the immediate uh, social environment that a kid is brought up in from birth. And the behaviors of that immediate family, those behaviors uh, tend to shape individuals uh, in 
in a in a rapid way uh because if you're if you're freudian by any stretch of the imagination you would believe that personality is developed by the age of six so if you think of personality as fully formed or or mostly formed by the age of six that means those behaviors and those models uh at a young age are helping kids develop uh their sense of kindness right and then what happens is kids move into schools and they're influenced by their peer group and school level factors, including the school climate and culture, uh, including uh, teacher behavior. And then beyond that, we have community factors. Uh, our local community, uh, our local community tends to influence the way that, that we think, act and respond. Uh, and then finally, we have these, these societal factors. These societal factors shift and change the way we view the world. Um, I use this example a lot, but when, when I was a kid, um, The Simpsons had just came out. I was in third grade when The Simpsons started. And uh, I had this t-shirt, it was called, it had Bart Simpson on it, and it said, underachiever and proud of it. Now, that shirt was banned in my school. You couldn't wear that shirt in school. But but I sent my daughter to school the other day uh, wearing a Hellfire Club uh, sweatshirt from Stranger Things, and the principal gave her a high five. And I'm thinking to myself that how times have changed, right? How how society has shifted what we view as as important, um, and and for better or worse, right? I mean, society shifts and changes all the time. Uh, and we always have to rise to those occasions. But we, when we think about kindness and we think about the, the behavioral development, society shifts the way we develop and the way we perceive being kind to one another. So that gets us through the definition of what kindness is. Now what I wanna do is talk about how we're gonna be teaching kindness and how we can teach kindness. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak about this from more of an educational perspective, but also through a parental lens, right? I'm a parent and I'm an educator. So I think about how I can apply these things within my own home, but also thinking about from, from a community perspective, how our educators can apply these, these concepts. So the first thing we have to think about when we are um, considering kindness and teaching kindness is the why. Why are we teaching kindness? And the reason why I say that is because uh, I'm in special education and I work with youth with disabilities. And, and some of the time, some things that we do um, in, in the arena of being kind also tokenizes individuals. So we have to watch out in, in being genuine in our behaviors that is going to support the other as opposed to just making ourselves feel better. That's the, that's the, the central point of the why. We wanna be kind, but we wanna be kind because being kind helps someone else, doesn't just help us make ourselves feel better, okay? The next, the next piece is what? What does kindness look like? Um, and in the literature, it's, it's hard to operationalize because kindness looks different to different people. And it's really a, a piece of not just behaviors, but perspective taking. So being kind for me and, and my behaviors and what I think is kind is going to be different than being kind for you and the behaviors that you would engage in. And then the, then the last one is this, this how. How do we how do we demonstrate our kindness? What is it that we do and what types of behaviors do we engage in that allow someone to say that person is engaging in an act of kindness? And so when we think about the why, why are we doing it? What are we doing and how are we doing it? Those things are central to kind of how we approach uh, kindness on a day-to-day. -day. So the way I believe that we should be doing this um, and the way uh, we have literature to suggest that when, when concepts like social and emotional learning is implemented in our schools, and even, con even these, these central concepts are, are talked about in our homes, that we, we develop kinder individuals. Our youth are kinder if they have this sense of self-awareness. If they know and love themselves and they can respect themselves and they care about themselves. Because we know that a lot of our behaviors, especially, especially our pro-social behaviors, 
are entrenched with how we view ourselves first. And so we want to teach this idea of self-awareness, but then we also want to teach this, this idea of social awareness. So we want to be aware of oneself, but we also want to be aware of how others around us view us, but how we view others around us and how others around us are feeling, thinking. Um, the next piece is self-management. And this piece is really important to, to acts of kindness because uh, not every day do we feel great. Not every day do we wake up in the morning and think this is the greatest day in the world. Some days we wake up and we're tired and some days we wake up and, and we don't feel good. But us being able to manage our own thoughts, wants, desires, and behaviors, if we can manage those things, then we can set ourselves up to engage in kindness, even if we don't feel great, okay? The next piece is relationship skills. And the reason re relationship skills are so important is because relationships are complex. And I'm gonna get into friendships in a second, but relationships are, are complex um, because there are all sorts of different relationships one can assume. And we have to learn how to navigate how these relationships function within our own worlds, right? We have relationships with our parents, which is different than relationships with our partners, which is different than relationships with our friends, which is then different from relationships with our colleagues or people we meet uh, just randomly. So we have to learn how to navigate those different types of relationships and be respectful in each one. And then the last piece is along the lines of being respectful in each one is teaching kids how to make responsible decisions. So teaching kids um, not just right and wrong, but ultimately how to make these decisions that, that serve everyone involved uh, in the most appropriate way possible. So how do we do this? The first thing that we have to think about in our schools is this idea of this hidden curriculum. Uh, the hidden curriculum is the, is the thoughts and behaviors that happen within a given environment and they become normative behaviors within the an environment, but they're not directly taught. These are those skills that everybody seems to possess, but nobody directly teaches them. And what happens a lot of times are kids that don't necessarily gain these skills. And I'm going to get into what some of these skills are in a second, but, but youth that don't gain these skills need to have some direct instruction. And when I think about what these skills are, these skills to me are social and communication skills. So uh, this hidden curriculum and being kind all revolves around the concept of, of socialization and social skills. And so if we're able to teach kids the appropriate social and communication skills, then we'll have far more acts of kindness but we will also have far less aggressive behavior in our schools. And so one thing that I encourage all educators to do is embed social skills into the daily curriculum. Now, there are, there are many, many ways that we can do this. There are many ways that, that you can embed these social skills into the daily curriculum, but one easy way or one relatively easy way is taking your lesson plan, looking at what you're doing for the day, looking at your learning objectives and add one social objective. For example, when I was teaching, uh, I taught math. Um, and when I was teaching math, I always had a lesson plan. And uh, one thing that I would do with that lesson plan is say, okay, today I'm gonna focus on collaboration. And so I would tell the kids today, I'm gonna be watching you and how you collaborate with one another. And then I would use behavior specific praise when they did engage in this collaboration. And this is a simple, this is a simple strategy that anyone can use. And it's easy enough to embed social skills into the daily curriculum. Now, what kinds of skills would we, we be embedding to kind of foster this kindness, but also social and communication skill development? So these are the 10 critical social skills that we tend to teach. And these 10 critical social skills, uh, there's a, I'm not going to go through each of them, but you can see I've already mentioned this concept of empathy. Um, empathy is one of those, one of those important components of, of being kind, but then it's following directions and cooperating with others and regulating your emotions and asking for help and respecting yourself and others, uh, listening and following directions, 
engaging in conversations, and I'm going to get into conversation in a second, following rules and routines, and taking pride in your work. And so these things uh, these things are the the critical social skills that are that are um, that are represented in the literature. But also, if we think about if we teach kids to to master or be competent at least in these ten social skills, we will have kids that engage in higher levels of of kind behavior. So, how do we teach these skills? Now, the main thing when we're thinking about kindness. The main thing is this first piece, this pre-correct. And the pre-correct, what that means is us modeling what we would expect. So I'm going to get into some messaging at, at the end of this. But one thing that I do want to, want to emphasize is this concept of, of us modeling what we would expect to see. Now, if you see me in public and, and you come up and introduce yourself to me, I can guarantee you that I'm going to model the behaviors that I would want my want my daughter to model, especially, you know, she's standing there with me and, and we're having conversations. And there have been a lot of times where I've been with my daughter and people have walked up to me and I've had a conversation with them and I've been been incredibly kind. And she she'll say to me, do you know who that was? And and I'll say, no, I just met them. Right. And it's one of those things to to model what we expect, because we can't tell kids we want them to do something if we're not doing it ourselves. So the first thing is we pre-correct and model. OK, the second thing is we give kids opportunities to engage in whatever we've just asked them to do. So if we're asking them to be kind, we have to model that and pre-correct it and teach them what that means. Then we have to give the kids opportunities to do that. Then following those opportunities and following the fact that they do engage in that kind behavior, then we give them behavior specific praise or positive specific feedback. So when we're doing that positive specific feedback, what we're doing is we're reinforcing the behavior that they just engaged in, which then reinforces their, their kind behavior, okay? Now, the problem with that is that all sounds easy. All these things sound easy to do. Model, give kids opportunities, give behavior specific praise. The problem is some of these some of these behaviors are really challenging. Think about conversations. I mean, think about how complicated conversations are. I mean, they're incredibly complicated. And I don't think that I can overstate how difficult it is for us to teach kids how to engage in conversations. Because what we do is we can teach kids how to engage in authoritative types of conversations. Uh, for example, it's a very linear conversation. You talk, I talk. You talk, I talk. You talk, I talk. Right? And that authoritative style of conversation is okay when we're teaching kids how to engage with uh, their parents, uh, guardians, uh, teachers, or mentors. Right? When we're when when they're talking to somebody in 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 a position of authority. But really when we're engaging with our friends or engaging with our peers, that's not the way our conversation goes. Our conversation is has this natural flow of us interrupting each other and us talking over each other and us trying to us trying to get a word in edgewise sometimes. And those types of things are nuanced and for some kids it may be learning a new skill. For other kids, it may just be generalizing a skill. But what's important when we think about conversations, it, what's important is that we recognize the complexity and we talk to kids about how important conversations are, but how they can change based on the person that you're talking to. The other thing that the other thing that wraps itself into this, the into conversations, but also kindness, is the concept of power of language. Because language matters, word choice matters, inflection matters. And I usually demonstrate this. I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to yell at the screen, but I usually demonstrate this in my pre service teacher class by like saying really, really aggressively, you know, like, I love you. Right. And, and like demonstrating that the tone in my voice and the words that are coming out of my mouth are conflicting. And so that's the power of language. Because one person may interpret that differently than another. And so we have to teach kids responsible word choice and responsible language choice 
when engaging with others. Uh, they will select different language and different word choice when engaging with peers than they would with uh, someone in the community versus their teacher or parent. And so we have to recognize that, that all of those situations require different skills. And I think we as adults, and I'm just making a, a general statement, we don't do a great job with that. We don't do a great job with talking to youth about how environments and behaviors within a given environment are different. So now that we're talking, now we've talked about teaching kindness and using behavior specific praise and, and giving kids opportunities, but most importantly, modeling. What I wanna get into now briefly is this concept of cultivating friendships. Because kindness and friendship, I believe, goes hand in hand. Um, I believe you need to, we do know uh, through literature that youth need to have one or two good friends uh, in order for, in order to have, you know, long-term success. Uh, they're more successful when they have one or two good friends. And so kindness and friendship go hand in hand. The problem, the problem that we have um, is that we don't, we don't really teach friendship um, because when we teach friendship, there's all of these different, um, all of these different definitions of what friendship, what friendship is. And I was given a talk on friendship the other day, and uh, I was talking to a group of, of educators, and I and I told them I said, you know, we teach we teach the importance of friendship, but we don't really teach the essence of friendship. And I think that that's the that's the challenge that we're that we're faced with, um, you know. Uh, friendship and cultivating friendship is, is challenging, uh, especially especially as we get older. So we have to develop those skills uh, those skills at a younger age. But the problem in the problem in schools is is we apply this concept of unidirectional friendship, um, and I will and I will tell you it's like this: uh, you can walk into any number of classrooms across the country, especially especially young classrooms, and you hear the word the word friend universally applied. Let's all let's all get together, friends, and we talk and and we we insinuate that all of our kids should be friends because they're sharing the same physical space. And that's, that is confusing for kids because what we're telling them is they, they should be friends regardless of any other variable other than the fact that they're sharing the same physical space. And that's not accurate. It's not accurate for us as adults. Um, I'm not friends with everyone that I work with. I'm friendly to everybody that I work with, and I engage in kindness with everyone that I work with, but I don't, I, I don't equate that to friendship. And I think if, if we really want to teach kindness in our schools, we have to start teaching the concept of being friendly as opposed to all of us being friends. Because honestly, kids are going to struggle making friends if we are forcing these unidirectional types of friendships. What we want is to teach kids bi-directional friendships. We want to teach kids that they don't have to be friends with everyone. They just have to be friendly. And being friendly is similar to being kind. Being friends with somebody is something that's much more complex. Okay, And I say that because this is a figure of what the landscape of friendship actually looks like. Right, So we have these resources and we have these needs and we have these activities, attitudes, and strengths that we bring to the table to, to cultivate a lasting friendship. Friendships are challenging and understanding the concept of friendship versus being friendly is putting us on a path for kids to be able to both be kind to more people and be kind to everyone but also cultivate friendships with people that share these types of values. So to actually be friends with somebody, to have a lasting friendship, what we want is our kids to have shared interests, okay? The friendship should be mutual or bi-directional. Uh, this friend group 
uh, or your friend should be loyal and trusted. Um, when you have a friend, you should that you should improve one another. Uh, you should support one another. So when we think about friendship, these friends have these shared interests. It is mutual. They improve and support one another, and they're loyal and trusted. And ultimately, this complex figure boils down to these five key components. And when we think about these five key components, we don't share this with very many people. And that's okay, because we don't have the human capacity to be friends with that many people. Uh, if you think about your, if you think about your friend list on Facebook or whatever, like for example, I have like 1200 friends on Facebook or something. And I, I don't have the human capacity to be friends with that many people. Uh, I couldn't imagine getting 1200 text messages on Friday night or rolling in 1200 deep to the local pub. We just can't do it. And so once we're able to disaggregate this, this concept of friends versus being friendly, we can start to cultivate cultivate this these behaviors of kids being more kind to one another because they can they can recognize that they don't have to be friends with everybody they just have to be friendly if we're going to be friends we should have a bi-directional friendship that has shared interests that we're loyal and trusted and we support each other and make each other better so now we're going to get into this concept of speaking with youth so how do we talk to you? Um, that's a question I get all the time because, you know, as a parent and, a, and an educator, uh, I, I have the opportunity to talk to youth all the time. And some are, are open books, some are willing to talk, and some are more closed off. And so this concept of, of how we navigate these conversations is challenging. And it's different at different age levels, and it's different with different age groups. But ultimately, what we want to do is we want to speak with youth and, and talk to youth about being kind, because we can model it and we can give kids opportunities. But if we haven't set these kids up for success, then we're, we're modeling and giving kids opportunities when they're, when they're not necessarily prepared. So the first thing, and this is part of a, this is part of a, a trade book that uh, I wrote with um, some of my colleagues and they were, and we were charged with this idea of, you know, how do we prevent bullying? Um, and one of the things that we thought about, and one of the things that the research suggests is, is uh, some of this, some of bully prevention, but also us engaging in, in kind behaviors, as I mentioned earlier, stem from us loving ourselves, stem from, stem from us having respect for ourselves, and stem from us liking the people that we are. And so, the first thing I tell any parent or educator that's really struggling with, uh, with uh, a youth in opening up is have a conversation about what they like about themselves. So talk to them about, about what's great about them because this is not a conversation that, that everybody has, but it is a conversation that helps build this idea of, of self, this self-awareness. and when we have these conversations about what we like about ourselves, then what we can do is we can embrace our individuality because we're not spending enough time talking to kids about this idea of individuality. Um, and it's a strange phenomenon because a lot of kids in schools today, they gravitate towards sameness, right? Even though they want to be individual, they still gravitate towards sameness, dressing the same, acting the same, talking the same, listening to the same thing, enjoying the same same uh, movies, music, um, which, is, which is part of having shared interest, right? But also it's important for somebody to be an individual because that's what separates people when they become adults. When when we separate ourselves and embrace our individuality, then we really set ourselves up to, to recognize that we don't have to be friends with everyone. We have to be friendly. And we set ourselves up to be more kind to one another because we are comfortable in, in, in our own skin. And I think that's the first conversation that adults should be having with the kids is what do you like about yourself? And if they say nothing, 
then that's a that's a red flag and and we should we should have further conversation but the next part of that is making sure that you tell them what's great about them and you talk to them about what's great about them and have them open up to to yeah. some of the the wonders that are that make them them uh yeah. for example if you work uh in special education at all or you've had the opportunity to sit in on uh, an IEP meeting, you would know that the first thing that we open up any IEP meeting with are student strengths. What does this student do well? And the reason why is because that sets the stage for uh, a more meaningful, kind meeting. So I know I'm assuming that everybody can also hear my dogs in the background snoring. So I keep talking louder. So like uh, to try to talk over them snoring. Um, so I'm sorry if that's uh, if that's uh, bothersome. Um, so in talking to youth about what makes them them and what what makes them what they like about themselves, this helps foster this communication development. Uh, it's important for youth to have an adult that they can communicate with. Uh, even even youth who engage in some of the kindest of behaviors uh, need somebody to, ha to have a conversation with. And, it, and one of the easiest ways for us to do that and, and something that, that I engage in in my daily practice with, with my own child is I ask my daughter about uh, direct questions. I don't just say, how was your day? Because they say fine, or she'll say fine. You know, I talk to her about like, what made you laugh today? And tell me one thing that was exciting today, or would you play at recess today? These questions allow for an open line of communication, but also they allow for this space uh, to be trusted and have a trusted adult youth relationship. And since we're speaking about kindness, this applies to many things. But since we're speaking about kindness, this also opens up this space where we can have conversations with kids about what it means to be kind. And, and we could add questions in here. What did you do that was kind today? Or who did you help today? Um, what made today a good day for you? And, what, and how did you make it a good day for someone else? And so when we're having these conversations with our youth, we can get past this, how was your day piece, right? And we can get into something like this. And these are quick ideas. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can Google these things and you can see any number of ideas for youth to engage in kindness. But I want to harken back to what we said earlier. Kindness is more than just the behaviors we engage in. Kindness is us emoting in a kind way or being, uh, being empathetic or sympathetic. Kindness is also us thinking, our, our cognitions, us being able to, to take the perspective of someone else. So all of those things manifest themselves in the behaviors, but we don't just want kids going through the motions, right? We want kids to to live a life of kindness. We want them to think about kindness and taking people's perspectives. We want kids to be able to empathize and sympathize. And then we also want kids to be able to engage in the behaviors that represent kindness. So you can see, I added a few things here that, that were just simple, simple concepts that, that all kids could do. Um, but like in general, uh, kids can compliment someone. And these are things that we all could do, right? Even if you're not a kid, but these are things that we all could do, right? So in general, we can we can compl compliment someone. Uh, one thing that I really enjoy doing is listening to someone's story because people are fascinating and everyone everyone's willing to share their story. And that's a really kind thing to do is if somebody starts telling you something, you listen actively. Um You'll never know how how much that means to people to have someone listen to them and validate their story. And the next piece up here is is help someone. I mean, push in a cart, open up a door, um, you know, help them uh, at the store, and do it with a smile. Like smile when when you're doing that. Now, when we're thinking about friends, uh, one thing that I think is great to do that that is that is something that we all should do for our friends is we should celebrate their successes. Um, 
I love celebrating my friends' successes because I feel a part of it, right? I feel like I, I feel like if if we continue to celebrate each other's successes, then we're in it together because that's what friends are supposed to be doing, right? Friends are supposed to have shared interests and loyalty and mutual respect. So we should be celebrating each other. Um, the next thing is is encourage each other to to step out uh, of our comfort zone or do something that we've been thinking about doing for a long time or provide some advice. Uh, and the next thing is be inclusive. Uh, I think it's important for us to open up our friend group and 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 be inclusive for those that that may have similar interests. We just haven't opened up the conversation to. Then we think about how uh, how kids can be kind to parents and adults. They can help with chores. Um, this is a big one, at least in my house, is have a conversation. When my daughter comes downstairs and she's like, dad, I got to tell you something. To me, that's one of the greatest things ever is because she's opening up and having this conversation about something she's interested in. Uh, and then also invite um, uh, invite an adult to play. Like if we're talking to, to kids and they're playing and they're into video games, maybe they should invite their parent in to play a video game. Uh, and then in the community, some kind things that we can do or we can teach kids to do is volunteer. Volunteering is always great. Donating is always great. Uh, but one thing that's really cool that I've seen a lot of people do, especially in this community, is they'll write inspirational notes on rocks uh, and they'll spread them around parks and people will find them. And then they'll need to either make their own rock or or share it and hide it in some other space. But it's always fun to get that. And it always makes it always made me and, and my family feel good. So the last thing that we're going to we're going to end with uh, before I open it up for any questions is the is messaging for youth. This is the these are the messages that I send to youth when I'm talking to them and have a chance to to interact with them in a larger forum in a face to face kind of environment. And these are messages that you can send to youth as well. But the first one is uh, demonstrate kindness by inviting others into your group. Um, like I said earlier, be inclusive, but. I mentioned that we all don't need to be friends, but we need to be friendly. And we as humans tend to gravitate towards people that have shared interests. And so if we're inclusive in our, in, in our friend group, then we're gonna find those people that have shared interests. And if we're kind and friendly within those groups, then other people that don't share those same interests will find another group with people that do have similar interests. And that's the way we should be navigating. And I guarantee you, that's the way a lot of you have functioned as your, as your interests have shifted and changed over the years. The next piece that I really like, as long as it's done in a safe way, is, is have a conversation with somebody new. Um, I think in schools, we should teach our kids to have conversations with, with, with their peers um, in, in different spaces uh, when they don't know them or they don't know them well. I'm always I'm always uh, perplexed when I walk into a school and, and kids in the same class don't know each other. Uh, I think they should be having conversations, but this goes to that point where we have to teach conversations. Then we go to the next next space, and, and I've mentioned this before, and I think that this is important. This is important for kindness, but it's just important for lifelong success to embrace your individuality. Be uniquely you. Be the person that that you want to be. Uh, because if you love yourself and if you embrace who you are, then that is the first step in being kind and friendly to others. But recognizing that you're never standing alone. So it's important to, to be uniquely you, but also know that you always have people in your corner. Um, you always have people to rely on, even when you feel like you don't, even when you feel like uh, there are things that, that you're struggling with. There's always people that that are there to support you. And this piece is important to me because I think uh, we are better as a people when we bring diverse uh, perspectives to the table. So when we work together and we bring diverse pr perspectives to the table, not only are we kinder people, we we move more rapidly towards whatever solution we're trying to work towards. And then this piece is uh, be the change that you want to see. 
uh, I know this is a, this is a, an old uh, used quite frequently statement, but it is true. If something is if something is is bothering you, or if you think that people aren't being kind enough, be the change that you want to see. And I'm going to end before questions on this last slide. Uh, this last slide is what I what I talk to kids about um, because it's important to me. Uh, I had the opportunity to play college football. Uh, had the opportunity to play with uh, the fifth most winningest college football coach in college football history. And uh, my my first day on campus, um, we had a team meeting and uh, our coach said, these are the these are the pillars of of success. This is what's going to make us successful. And this is what will make you successful individually. But this is what may, will make us successful as a team. Uh, and the first one is do the right things. Uh, do the right things even when nobody's watching. Uh, and if you if you subscribe to that and you think about this this talk on kindness, then most of the time those right things are doing the kind thing. And even when nobody's watching, is that is an important piece to that. The next piece to this is give your best effort. Nobody's ever going to fault you for for giving it all you got. Nobody will ever fault you for that. Um, so part of part of what we do and part of what I teach my own kids and my team and the students that I work with is as long as we're giving it our best shot, then we have we can be proud of of our success and we can also go to sleep at night and feel proud of what we've accomplished. And then the last piece up here is have class. Uh, I think it when when we think about kindness kindness goes hand in hand with do the right things but also having class kindness goes hand in hand with with how you present yourself when you're around people uh it's it's important to to think about how you hold yourself and so if you see me out in public i can guarantee you that that i will smile i'll shake your hand i'll have a conversation with you and and i will have as much class as i know how to have um and if, if we teach kids to live by these three things, they will not only be more successful, but they will also be kinder individuals. Uh, but these are the three pillars of success that I teach in my home. These are the three pillars of success that I teach for my team at the Mizzou Ed Bully Prevention Lab. These are the three pillars of success that I've used in my classrooms when I work with youth. Uh, and I think all of these things cultivate uh, a greater sense of kindness for our youth. With that, I will leave it with a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, this is my contact information. Should you uh, want to reach me, you can check out our social media. Um, I tend not to do our social media. My, my team manages it, but we've been doing a lot of cool things lately. If you want to see any of the work that we're doing, that'd be great. But, uh, but here is how you can get a hold of us. Uh, and I will be happy to look at the chat for any questions. Uh, if you don't have any questions at this time, but you have questions later, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, if you didn't get that last slide, I'll put my email in the chat right here. I'm not seeing any questions. Don't be shy, folks. If you've got a question, that was a lot of information. That's amazing how much you got in in that amount of time. <laughs> that was a lot. It was a lot. All, all great stuff, that's for sure. I tell you, the whole conversation piece is something I think people forget. It was nice to be reminded about. Yeah, conversations are tough. I mean, they're, they're, uh, it's a challenging skill for sure. Oh, here comes something. Uh, how do you teach kids to have conversations with people that they don't really like? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I got kind of a short story i guess for that i remember one time uh my my daughter got in trouble at school because she was apparently bullying another kid and uh and um she went through and she was explaining it to me and she ended this by saying it's okay daddy tomorrow i'll go play with her and i told her i said look i don't need you to play with her i just need you to be friendly to her and so we talked about this very thing right we talked about um does she have to have a conversation um, and if she does have a conversation, then uh, to be friendly. 
Uh, and I tend to try to get kids to avoid avoid some level of conversation if it's unnecessary uh, because because not everybody has to like each other, right? But if it's necessary within a given um, within a given classroom context or social context, then it's important for for kids to empathize. So recognize that one thing that I teach one one thing I teach a lot of folks is that we never bear someone else's burdens, right? I never, when somebody else is, is angry with me or saying something mean to me or negative, I always err on the side of that person has something else going on in their lives. And it's just a reflection of that. And so I tend to teach kids that if something else is going on in their life and, um, and if something else is going on in their life and they're just reflecting or projecting, then that's easier for us to navigate, I think. And I think that's easier for kids to navigate too. And so basically um, that's how I approach it is saying, you know, if, if they're projecting, uh, then try to end the conversation um, and be as respectful as possible. Uh, if, if the conversation is damaging uh, or hurtful, then I would encourage them to engage with uh, either a trusted adult or uh, a trusted friend to kind of navigate their feelings of that, but always teaching them this, this concept of empathy um, to, to try to take, their, take the perspective of the other person. But that's a difficult one. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you so much. I don't know if Kim's able to come back or not. <laughs> I just unmuted myself so that I could tell you how much I appreciate you, Chad. How lucky, for one thing, how lucky your daughter is to have you as a father, but then how lucky <laughs> your sons you. are to have you as such a great uh, role model and so full of um, not only knowledge, but passion toward the topic. And I think that is something that I very much admire. And I thank you so much for sharing your skills with us and sharing you with us. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And a huge thank, just thanks to Children's Grove for this evening as well for bringing us this topic. So thanks everybody for coming and have a great evening.